Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another VFR flight planning video and apologies for the almost unforgivable delay in finishing this next leg. Since the last video, I've been posted to a different base which obviously involves a house move, a period of training, some general work and family stuff. Anyway, excuses, excuses, let's waste no more time. Our journey from St Mary's to Wick has found us parked at Kemble for quite some time and it's high time we pressed on to our next stop which is Blackpool. Some notices to start, a lot of this video will cover much of what we covered in the first leg and I make no apologies for that. The flight planning process is fundamentally cut and paste, but that's not to say it isn't interesting. The way I see it is, if you find it a bit repetitive, then you become unfamiliar with the process and that's a good thing. That being said, I'll skip unnecessary detail that we've already covered and look for some new areas to delve into. Our rules of engagement for today. First and foremost, we're going to fully plan a VFR flight in UK airspace, including fuel and balance calculations. We'll explore military air traffic zones and MOD airfields and see how they differ from standard air traffic zones. And we'll briefly talk about temporary controlled airspace, which does poke its head up today. Finally, I'll mention some chart symbology changes that are on the horizon. In terms of planning equipment, it'll be much the same as last time. This flight will take us across the boundary between the northern and southern half mil charts, so you'll need one of each. My cross-country qualifier took me from Liverpool to Wolverhampton, up the low-level corridor to Blackpool and back, so you get no sympathy from me. Edition 44 of the Southern Chart will be released on the 29th of March this year, and Edition 41 of the Northern Chart will be out on the 26th of April, so make sure you're up to date when the time comes. For this video, I'm using Editions 43 and 40 respectively, which are both just about in date. I'm using the CRP5 flight computer this time, just to mix things up, and I'll be planning this trip in the Arrow, which is my current weapon of choice, coincidentally based out of Kemble. It gives us a couple more things to talk about. I don't have a hard copy pilot operating handbook for this aircraft, but I do have a soft copy, so I'll be referring to that as required. And yes, I'm still using the quickies. You can't oppress me. Okay, quick recap of the process. Where are we going from and to, and how are we getting there? Check we're good to go before we waste any more of our time. Gather the essential plan and admin, detailed weather and no tams, etc. Plot the route, and this will necessarily lead us back to admin when we find new things to research as they become apparent, finishing it all off with fuel and balance calculations. By now you should be familiar with the following bookmarks. Met Office for your winds, pressures and temperatures. AIS or UK no tam info, depending on how you like your information presented. And NATS Aeronautical Information Service, which we'll end up bouncing back to again and again. On the back burner, have a link to the UK Air Navigation Order and one to the EASA homepage. Very useful for staying up to speed on regulations. I'll briefly link both of those sites again shortly. Let's get to work. We'll leave Campbell and route to Hereford, where I think I've spotted a nice lake feature on the chart. From there we'll take a right turn and head to the Shawbury overhead. Next waypoint is Ashcroft Farm Airstrip, lining us up nicely for the low level corridor between Liverpool and Manchester. Careful not to touch the sides, we'll make a beeline for Lee Flash VRP, and from there we'll route direct for Blackpool. Our alternate today is Barrow, a short hop across Morecambe Bay. They're the broad strokes, let's see if that's achievable. I'm going to check the NOTAMs first by heading over to the NATS AIS webpage. If I click on the NOTAM tab I can create a narrow route brief, as long as I've registered a free account, otherwise that option won't be visible. I just need to enter a few rough details, from and to, window of time, my flight rules, maximum level, and the width of my theoretical corridor. Pop the alternate in, click submit, and see what comes back. It'll produce a whole page full of information that you can scroll through, and you'll find that most of it isn't relevant to our flight. I've highlighted a few things that we do need to be aware of. It looks like there's a Royal Flight leaving Kemble today, bringing some temporary controlled airspace with it, fancy that? That kicks in at 0940, so we want to be gone before that to avoid delays. At our destination, the Blackpool NDB is poorly. Not to be outdone, Barrow's NDB is fully broken. We've got some offshore cranes to think about as we make our approach to destination, and possibly for the transit to our alternate. We've still got the chart error, depicting Ashton Down as a disused airfield, which makes sense given that we're using the same chart but that should disappear when edition 44 is released. Our flight takes place on the 19th of March, and most of those no times are dated the day before. That's just because of the time I checked. In reality, we check them as close to the flight time as possible. That said, it's very likely, if not certain, that most or some of these no times will repeat the following day. 
If, like me, you prefer pretty pictures, head to notamminfo.com forward slash UK map. You can broadly select the period and level on the right hand side, after which you just cherry pick the icons on your route and see which ones are relevant. I've circled a couple here, and they turn out to be the items we've already found. Moving further up. Shawbury is unable to accept visiting aircraft, and the instrument runway is slippery when wet. Up near our destination I've highlighted the cranes, and the broken NDBs. If you were wondering why I didn't choose Woodvale as an alternate, it's because their runway is broken. They've got a shorter runway, but I'm just not that keen to visit, to be honest. As far as no times go, we're okay, so let's check the weather. Again, register a free account with the Met Office General Aviation Service, and you've got unlimited access to all the information you need. Pressures are under the Regional Forecasts tab, and you'll find winds, weather, and temperatures under Briefing Charts. The CAA chart shows the altimeter set in regions, but if you're still not sure, go to the AIS website and look at the handy little chart in the en route section. We'll be flying in the Cotswold, Barnsley and Hollyhead regions, with a brief dip under the Manchester TMA, and we'll come on to that shortly. You can make a note of your regional Q&Hs, or you can just wait for the ATC to give them to you on the fly. The best reason to visit this page is to determine how far from ISA the mean sea level pressures are. That could be important when you're doing your calculations later. We're not a million miles away, so I'm just going to use 1013 when the time comes. Looking at the form 214, we can afford to be a bit lazy and just use one of the spot wind boxes for our entire flight. You could argue that we might also want to use the one above, but it looks like six and two threes to me. As we saw from the last video, whether you use one or three really doesn't increase your workload that much. Accuracy is what's important. On the Form 215, it's Area B that'll be our playground, and it largely reflects the aftermath of the mini beasts from the east, with reduced visibility and isolated snow showers and mountain wave activity. We're not going that near any mountains, so hopefully we can expect the forecast 30 kilometers, though we might want to be wary of the clouds if we want to stay VMC. We've got everything we need to start planning, but it is worth briefly mentioning the final two important bookmarks for when you occasionally want to research some regulations such as medical, licensing, recency, etc. Also, don't forget your club specific rules. The UK Air Navigation Order can be found with a quick internet search. If you get to the CAA website, you can download a copy or click on the link which will take you to an online version. The EASA homepage has links to a compendium of information that covers all aspects of aviation operations. Hovering over the regulations tab will drop a menu down with a couple of useful pilot specific links. So far we're good to go, we've noted the weather and the NOTAM so let's see what we need to carry on board. This is a tricky area, the UK Air Navigation Order has quite a specific condensed list in Schedule 10. Whereas the CIRA, Air Operations Gen section, has roughly the same information spread over a few pages. They're not exactly identical, but that arises from the differences between EASA and non-EASA flights. Definitely worth a browse when you get the chance, and maybe you can tell me why I've put an asterisk next to the tech log. On a simpler note, we might as well load up the UK AIP because we're going to be in and out of that as the planning continues. We can start by getting the aerodrome charts for our destination and alternate, and have a look at the textual information because it'll tell you of any restrictions or conditions. For example, Barrow is strictly prior permission required, so even though it's only our alternate, we should probably give them a call to let them know our plan. If we land at Blackpool as planned, we'll just give them a follow-up call to stand them down. Time to get our hands dirty with the VFR flight log. This is my trusty double-sided laminated companion. Remember that we can divide the columns into three categories, which I've colour-coded here. Chart items are in green, reference information is blue, and calculations are red. We'll do them in that order as much as possible, noting the dependencies as we move from left to right. OK, get your chart, a pen and a bike spanner. Waypoint 0 is Kemble. Waypoint 1 is the lake in Hereford I was talking about earlier. It turns out though, 
that the blue splodge I was looking at is just a meandering stream as seen here on Google Earth. A much better visual reference would be the sports track which is also marked on the chart. By the way, Google Earth is a handy way to scope out your waypoints, accounting for seasonal changes. It's also useful to a small extent for eyeballing a suitable field should your engine fail after takeoff. Every little helps. Moving on to the Shawbury overhead. Before making our way to the low level entry point. Ashcroft airstrip is potentially going to be difficult to see, but there are more obvious features nearby that can point us in the direction, all marked on the chart. If you keep Alton Lake on the left, you're on the right track. From there we'll head straight for the exit. Before turning direct to Blackpool. There are some really helpful features in the low level corridor that will keep us on track. And whoever came up with the name Cockshop Burn should never have to buy a drink again in my opinion. The two exit VRPs are very easy to see and you might be surprised how close together they are and therefore how narrow the corridor is. But hang on a minute, what is this corridor all about? Into the AIP we go. This is an en route corridor so it makes sense to look in the en route section of the AIP and I'll bet it's there but trying to find a quicker way and realising that we're squeezing between Liverpool and Manchester I decided to visit the Liverpool aerodrome page and sure enough there it is. By similar logic, you could argue that, as it's the Manchester TMA, we should be looking at the Manchester information. Again, you'll find a similar diagram. Earlier on, when we were researching the altimeter set and regions, we noted that this portion existed separately as the Manchester TMA, and these charts show that we should be on the Manchester QNH as we transit. Looking at the Manchester Airport textual information, we can see a number of ATIS frequencies that we can use to pick up the current pressure setting as we approach. We need to be not above 1,300 feet throughout the transit and for obvious reasons it's important we get it right. Back to the chart to highlight our alternate airfield, Barrow. We can now enter those legs onto our flight log before heading back to join the dots and get directions. We're going to connect our hexagons with a straight line, avoiding the inside so we can clearly identify our reference points. But when we measure, we're going to measure all the way from centre to centre, accounting for the full distance to be flown. Again, make sure you're using the correct edge of the ruler that matches the scale of your chart, and if it's your preference, drop a halfway mark to help with your airborne estimates. I've just pulled a random ruled line off the internet, so ignore these graphics. If you're playing along, hopefully you got the same rounded figures that I did. Pop them into your log. Grab your protractor. And head back to the chart. To measure the true track accurately, we need to place the center of our protractor on the line to be measured and make sure it's square by checking that nearby latitudes and longitudes poke out the edges at similar points. To maintain generality, although it absolutely makes no difference on scales this small, I like to place the centre on the halfway point. The added benefit of this is that it allows the possibility that your leg might naturally extend beyond the protractor in both directions, which will allow a nice easy alignment and reading. If that doesn't happen, simply artificially extend the line with a straight edge and read your true track where the line pops out in the direction of your flight. What you can also do at this point, and it's personal preference, is add short 10 degree fan lines out from each turning point, which will help you make quick off track corrections when the forecast winds inevitably aren't doing as advertised. Some people like to also add fan lines into each turning point and extend them so they overlap with the outbound arc. Again, it's personal preference. These charts contain a lot of information and it's easy to obscure it with excessive doodling, so that's just something to bear in mind. I'll point out that this is the full extent to which I'll mark the chart. Anything you see from this point forward you should consider only part of the video. 
add our true track information to our log and then back to the chart for our minimum safe altitudes. But first, a quick recap on the process. Remember last time we talked in detail about terrain spot heights, maximum elevation figures, and obstacles. Noting that on our chart at least, obstacles up to 300 feet are generally not shown and should therefore be considered to be everywhere. So for each leg, we'll note the highest terrain point, add our imaginary 300 foot obstacle, and see if it beats the highest actual obstacle in the same region. Once we have a winner, we'll round it up to the nearest 100 feet and add a 1000 feet separation. If you're feeling lazy, you can just look for the highest maximum elevation figure for all the graticules that your leg crosses and then add a 1000 feet to that. That'll likely result in a higher restriction than you need, but it will be safe at least. For practical purposes, I like to use the square protractor because it has a nice half mil scale 5 mile radius circle in the middle and by moving that along the route, I can easily see everything that falls within. If you don't have one of those, then the standard ruler is 5 miles wide at the same scale. You just need to be creative when capturing your endpoints. Run your device along the track and identify your region of terror. I've temporarily removed the fan lines for clarity, but in practice they'd still be there. On this first leg, I've identified a mast at 1,217 feet above mean sea level, and also a terrain height of 971 feet. After adding our theoretical 300 foot obstacle, we find that coincidentally, these are both equivalent datums, and in fact, there are a couple more equivalent spot heights in the same area. See if you can find them. Remember, we're only adding 300 feet to the terrain points. If we're using the mast as the datum, we wouldn't need to account for hidden obstacles. And as always, if I've made a mistake or you see something I've missed, pop it in the comments so everyone can benefit from the correction. As it starts to get a bit crowded, use some logic to help you. The map coloration shows you where the ground rises, so that should draw your attention. And we often like to put masts on high ground, although as you can see, that's not always a fair assumption. Short hops over water are always a pleasure to plan with very little in the way of obstacles and if the wind's in our favour we could be on for a straightened approach to runway 3-5 at Barrow should we need to divert. For clarity I like to note my altitudes as decimal thousands, it generally doesn't need to be more accurate than that. And now it's time for the mental fly through which will determine our planned altitudes and direct us to any further research as required. Airborne and we're immediately tasked with avoiding Aston down. We could phone them before we go to see if they're active today, otherwise it's going to be a quick climb or a dog leg around. We'll almost certainly want to call Gloucester, even if they're not using runway 09 today, their NDB hold for runway 27 extends west of the airport and it's down to 2,300 feet, so they'll appreciate hearing from us as we transit. If we stray too far, we'll reach Delta 216 and looking in the en route section of the AIP, we can see that it's active up to altitude 2,300 feet unless notified and there were no no tam saying any different when we checked earlier. We are planned to fly this leg at 3,000 feet and be prepared to adjust if Gloucester have traffic to affect. We then cross over into the Barnsley Altima to Seton region and our next speaking unit will be Shawbury. According to the AIP, their large service extends to 40 nautical miles, which is about here. On the previous page it goes into a bit more detail on what we can expect from a large service and depending on the cloud cover it might be wise to ask for a traffic service as we will be transiting the Shawbury area of intense aerial activity so there could be a lot of rotary traffic knocking about. We will plan to stay at 3000 feet for this leg which will keep us out of the weekday low flying system. It will also mean a match transit so let's look at that in more detail. This is the match in question. They've generally got a 5 mile radius with one or more rectangular stubs lined up with the instrument runway out to a further 5 miles 
and two miles either side of the extended centre line. Shawbury also has the turn hill mats bolted on the side and it's not unusual to find combined military zones like this. I've also highlighted some ATZs in red, notice that each mat will have its own ATZ and Slape, not Sleep, is hanging out to the northwest. We can see all this clearly on the chart, what's not clear is the vertical profile. From the ground up we see that the stubs don't begin until 1000 feet above aerodrome level, then all together it goes up to 3000 feet. Not forgetting the ATZ, which stops at 2000 feet. As always, a map of all military air traffic zones in the UK can be found in the en route section of the AIP, and if you overlay the large service coverage, you'll find that the military's got your back. From experience, trying to hand over a large tract of East Midlands is like trying to palm off a glowing pellet of plutonium-238. I've held onto an aircraft until it nearly fell off the edge of the planet and they insisted they didn't have overlap and radar cover. On the flip side, Norwich have always been excellent and Farnborough worked their socks off in really busy airspace. Anyway, back in the AIP we can see that permission to transit the mats is not mandatory for civil flights, although it's fair to say that it's in everybody's best interests and it's just good airmanship. What classification of airspace is the mats? Well, similar to an ATZ, it's the same classification as the airspace surrounding it, which in most cases is Class G. I can't think of a permanent counterexample, but when temporary controlled airspace is active, it usually becomes Class D. On the subject of military airfields, we do welcome practice approaches from the GA community, as long as it fits around station-based traffic, and we're generally kitted out with a number of instrument approach options, including the military-only Precision Approach Radar, or PAR. We're not allowed to offer it to civil pilots due to the limited training available, but if you ask for one, we can give it to you. All the information you need regarding rules and insurance, etc., can be found in the JSP360, which is readily searchable online. And this is the actual front cover, absolutely no expense spent. Let's get back to our route. Leaving the Shawbury overhead, we will pass almost directly overhead Tilstock, which is a busy para dropping site. We could tune their frequency on our second box, but hopefully Shawbury's owner will make us aware of any traffic. According to the chart we found earlier, we need to be below 2,500 feet Manchester QNH by the time we hit the lateral limit of the TMA boundary, and we need to be below 1,300 feet when we enter the corridor. We're still in the Shawbury area of intense aerial activity, so we'll make it a late descent and stay up at 3,000 feet for as long as we dare. Shawbury will be looking to get rid of us as we approach Whitegate, so the next frequency is dealer's choice. If we get into any trouble in the corridor, our nearest licensed option is Manchester Barton, avoiding the elephants in the room. So we could listen out on their frequency during the transit. This might also be a good time to tune the Blackpool Atus and plan our arrival. We pop out from under the TMA into the Hollyhead Altimeter Set and Region, and we should quickly call Wharton for a match transit into Blackpool. The Blackpool textual data in the AIP gives us plenty of useful information for planning our arrival, not limited to what's on screen, so it's definitely worth a read. For our final two legs, we'll be 1200 feet in the corridor, and when we pop out from under the TMA, I'm going to climb back to 3000 feet for no good reason. If we do divert to Barrow, there's not a lot in our way, so to mix things up a bit, I'll transit at 2000 feet. In reality, with a single engine prop over 10 miles of open water, we'd probably go a bit higher than that should the worst happen. I don't fancy spending the night on an oil rig. Make a note of our plans in the flight log, and see what the forecast winds are doing at those levels. We're not going above 5,000 feet at any point, but we are going above 2,000 feet, and it's significantly colder than ISA in these lower levels. We can interpolate more accurate figures for our intended levels, and even super interpolate down to hundreds of feet. There's no guarantee that we're accurate, or even that the forecast is accurate for the time we fly, but we can only do our best. Add these figures to our flight log. And now it's time to start doing some calculations. Start with the true airspeed. We're going to use the outside air temperature and our planned altitude to find our true airspeed, using the temperature information we tweaked a minute ago. When we looked at the pressures across the altimeter setting regions earlier, we noted that they were within a couple of hectopascals of ISA. So for these calculations, we'll assume our planned altitude is a pressure altitude. We want an airspeed, so we need the airspeed window. As accurately as you can, set the pressure altitude against the temperature at that level. Find your indicated airspeed on the inner wheel, 
and read off your true airspeed on the outer wheel. Assuming an indicated airspeed of 135 knots, we get 137 knots in return. Add that to the log and remember to use the right temperature for each area and altitude when you calculate the remaining values. It's really easy to leave the whiz wheel in park and drive away if you know what I mean. Next, we're going to use our true airspeed, true track and the wind to work out our true heading and ground speed. First using the wind down method, make sure you've got the low speed side of the slide rule facing you, set the wind direction at the top and place the centre of the wheel on the horizon. Draw an arrow from the centre down to the wind speed, 32 knots in this case. Once that's done, set your true track against the datum, slide the centre over your true airspeed and see where your wind arrow ends up. In this case we're looking at 12 degrees left. So we need to turn the wheel 12 degrees left or anti-clockwise. Our arrow is now an extra degree left so we need to turn the wheel an extra degree and we keep doing this until the chase is over. We've ended up stopping with 13 degrees of port drift giving us a true heading of 329 degrees and a ground speed of 141 knots. Which makes sense when we consider that the wind is hitting us from over our right shoulder. The wind up method is much simpler in my opinion. Again set the wind direction at the top, but this time place the centre below the horizon as far as the wind speed, so you'll draw your arrow up to the horizon. Set your true track against the datum, but this time place the end of your arrow on your true airspeed. The arrow tells you how many degrees you need to turn and in which direction, and the centre of the circle is on your ground speed. Add these to the log and calculate the other legs, remembering that each leg has its own set of input values. Once these are done, a simple speed distance time calculation will get us our times. Speed is a rate of change of position with respect to time, so set the speed against the time index. And speed equals distance over time. In other words, you'll find your distance over your time. Look for 34 on the outer wheel and read off 14.5 or 14 and a half minutes on the inner wheel. And 35 is a quarter of 140, so roughly a quarter of an hour sounds right. Add it to the log and complete the column, remembering not to leave your whiz wheel in park. A quick chart reference item will turn our true heading into a magnetic heading. Looking at the chart, there's an isogonic line bisecting our first waypoint, and given its general direction relative to ours, we can see that this is going to be the only player, which is confirmed by looking at the next nearest lines to the east and west. We need to find the magnetic variation value for this line, which will be hugging it at some point, or failing that it will be sat where the line meets the map margin. If we scroll up a little bit along our route, we find the value near the Turnhill Mats boundary, and it's 1.5 degrees west. West is best and east is least, so we add the 1.5 to our true headings, and that gives our magnetic headings. In reality, I round this up to 2 degrees, and don't forget to correct for compass deviation in accordance with the aircraft specific card. And that's the log more or less complete, we'll add our actual arrival times during the flight. It's an ocean of information, and I like to easily pick out what's important at a glance. So I draw boxes around the headings to be flown and the time, so I can turn the aircraft and check the stopwatch without fuss. You could write those values in a different colour, or just leave them as they are, it's your choice. I also like to separate my alternate, otherwise I'd just end up going all the way there. Route plotted, we're nearly there, time for some fuel calculations. To work out the total fuel required, we need to know our fuel consumption and our planned flight time. Add to that our estimated taxi usage, planned holding time and diversion, and the amount we'd like to have when we land, plus the fixed unusable amount. Fuel consumption is a rate of change of fuel over time, so set the fuel consumption against the time index. Our flight only involves a short climb before we lean off, so I'm only going to use the lean value of 9 US gallons an hour, but more about that shortly. Set 9 against the time index and read off the total fuel over the leg time, which is 1 hour and 9 minutes to Blackpool. That gives us 10.35 US gallons. And while we're here, the total flight time to our alternate is 1 hour 20 minutes, which gives a total fuel of 12 US gallons. The extra 1.65 US gallons is our alternate fuel. 
This is my laminated fuel and balance page, which I've populated with the aircraft fuel capacity of 50 US gallons, tabs and unusable fuel, which is 34 and 2 respectively. I've also noted the climb consumption and the cruise consumption, which are 30 and a 9 US gallons an hour. Start with 2 gallons for taxi, 10.35 for the cruise to destination, 1.65 to divert, half an hour landing reserves and two unusable gallons. We don't plan on doing any airborne holding for this flight. This gives us a total volume of 20.47 US gallons. So what's our endurance? This is a very similar calculation to the last one and one occasion where you can park the whiz wheel. Fuel consumption is still set at nine and we can read the time that gives us on the inner wheel against our total usable fuel on the outer wheel. Under 18.47, we found about 2 hours and 3 minutes endurance. If we taxi out at 9am, we should be airborne by 10 past, which gets us out before the controlled airspace and keeps us airborne until around about 11.13 at the latest, though we should have landed at Blackpool by 20 past 10. As an aside, most of the flying clubs I've been a member of make it standard practice to refuel to tabs after every flight which usually gives you more than you need and can sometimes cause problems. For example, if you're in a Cessna 150 filter tabs and your passenger is on the large side, you can find your mass and balance out of limits with no option to defuel. If we've got more fuel than we need, it is still worthwhile doing the endurance calculations. If you do plan on having one or more lengthy climbs, then it's also worth factoring that into your fuel calculations. You'll need to add the climb portion as a separate leg in your log because, in this aircraft at least, you'll be climbing at 100 knots indicated which will need to be converted to a true airspeed, averaging the wind as best you can, I've used the 2000 foot values. This will give you new headings and an updated ground speed. To work out the distance you need to know your time in the climb, and the pilot operating handbook has this handy graph which allows us to make an educated guess. It's cold today and the density altitude at 2000 feet is closer to 500 feet, which gives us 850 feet per minute. A quick division on the flight computer gives a climb time of 3 minutes 32 seconds, which, at 101 knots ground speed, takes us just shy of 6 miles downrange, where we are level off at about 0914 hours. Not forgetting to subtract this distance from the Hereford leg in the next row. And the fuel consumption during all of this? About a quarter of a gallon extra. Still, it's always worth knowing how. Fuel completed, mass and balance, and we're done. The tech log will give you fixed values like your aircraft's basic weight, and the lever arms for all the load datums. You can just copy those across. And if you fly the same aircraft regularly, keep them there until the next aircraft weigh in. Next, we need to quantify exactly what we're carrying and where on the aircraft. In the front row, it'll be me and my lad with a combined weight of 108 kilograms. We'll be transporting three male juvenile Barbary macaques of a slightly mischievous disposition, or at least two having a thirds easily led. We've got 20.47 US gallons of fuel and the baggage compartment is holding 12 kilograms of bananas. For our load sheet, we first need to convert kilograms to pounds, so back to the flight computer. Set 108 under the kilograms datum and read off the value in pounds under the pounds datum. With 2.2 pounds to the kilo, it should be a little more than double, so 238 pounds sounds fair. Do the same for the other kilogram conversions. The fuel is expressed as a volume, which we'll convert to a mass using a specific gravity, and that's 0.72 for Avgas, meaning Avgas weighs 72% of an equivalent volume of water. Set the fuel volume under the USG datum, Find the pounds arc and read the weight under the 72 marker. We get 123 pounds, which we'll add to our load sheet. The next step is a straightforward multiplication of each mass by its respective lever arm length, and that gives us the moment for each position. Multiplication is not a time-based calculation, so we use the decimal index, which is the number 10 on the inner wheel. Now we find the sum of all the masses and the sum of all the moments. 
We multiplied the mass by the lever to get the moment, so now we divide the moment by the mass to get the final lever, or centre of gravity. 175,071 over 2008 gives 87.5 over the decimal index. That's our load sheet complete, and if we plot our mass against our CFG on the aircraft's load graph, we can see that the lines intersect comfortably within the flight envelope. If the cheeky monkeys decide to jump in the front, the center of gravity is going to come forward to this area, depending on how many move forward. Whereas, if they head for the bananas, our CRG is going to move back here. Again, all comfortably within the aircraft limits, even if you're not entirely happy about the situation. That's us all planned and ready to go. I quickly want to talk about temporary controlled airspace, as it does pop up regularly, and Kemble is certainly a frequent victim. We saw earlier that the dimensions and times of the airspace will be specified in a NOTAM. The AIP talks in detail about controlling authority, that is, whose permission you need to enter and what service you can expect inside. Temporary controlled airspace is activated for fixed wing flights and it is controlled airspace in every way. Last summer I was on Bryce Lars and the number of GA flights that infringed the 7.5 mile zone was unbelievable. They either hadn't read the NOTAM misread the timings or assumed a five mile radius just don't do it guys at best you'll receive a hefty fine from the caa at worst a global express is going to wear you like a brooch all the way to balmoral castle royal helicopters on the other hand operate in low level corridors which are purely theoretical and avoidance only really applies to the military flights though it makes sense to know where they are and keep a good lookout when they're active the Aeronautical Information Service are introducing some new symbology starting from UK South Edition 44 and it's all to do with wind farms which seem to be taken over the UK countryside. Not that I'm complaining, they're great navigation features that you can see from miles away. At the moment they use the generic mast icon with a larger wind farm surrounded by a dotted line. As of next week they'll be using actual wind turbine icons with variations to differentiate between close and widespread groups as well as showing whether they're illuminated or not. Finally, some questions for you guys. Question 1. You're aware that a Royal Low Level Corridor is active in your area and you hear the call sign Leopard on frequency. Who's flying that aircraft? Question 2. You've got a problem in the Manchester TMA Corridor and decide to make a precautionary landing at Barton. What area should you avoid over flying to the northeast of the aerodrome? If you take part, then please put the official reference with your answer. A generic internet search is not an acceptable means of compliance. Anyway, that's enough from me. I hope you found this useful and I look forward to seeing you on the next adventure, whenever that may be. Thanks for watching.